<laughs> well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, appreciate you being here on such a beautiful day, a good day to talk about the uh, wildland ethic and what it means to us here in Montana. If you've been listening, you will notice that we are having a little bit of technical trouble um, with one of our speakers, Del Burke, but we have our other speaker, Wayne Chamberlain, here ready to go. And in just one second, I will introduce him. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say a couple of quick things. Um, this program is being offered as part of the 47th Annual Montana History Conference. Uh, we've been doing this for 47 years. This is our first time, however, to do it virtually. And as you have noticed, we're still learning a little bit. Uh, it's not quite like being together in person. It's, uh, if we can get it all worked out, it's better than not being together at all, though. We do want to thank the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation uh, for their support of the conference. They've been supporting it for years and it means a lot to us and enables us uh, to do things we wouldn't able be, otherwise be able to do. Want to encourage you, we still have a couple of things left coming up later in the month and then even some things in October. So I encourage you to go to our uh, homepage on the web, mt.org his.gov and uh, click the history conference link and see what else is coming up. Good programs like this one. And with that, I'm going to introduce Wayne. And Wayne, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen if you're ready. Okay, I will share a screen now. Okay. And Wayne Chamberlain has spent the last 40 years in Montana, uh, splendidly called the last best place. He is a retired physician. Uh, who is fortunate to choose his adopted home in Helena. A lover of all that is outdoors Montana, he is privileged to know and work with exceptional people who are infatuated with Montana and defend its wild, quiet places. And he and Del Burke uh, have uh, edited this new book, and I'm going to turn it over to Wayne and let him get going and tell us all about it. Okay, as I start, just to give you an update, what I've got on my screen is my uh, computer screen is my desktop, which will give me access to my keynote slideshow, if that sounds okay with you, Kirby. Yes, that will be perfect. Because I am uh, new, fairly new to the Zoom conferencing, so it's uh, something to learn and it's enjoyable. And I want to start off by saying I want to thank Kirby I want to thank the Montana Historical Society, which I'm pleased to be a member of and a supporter of. And I want to uh, thank all the listeners here today that are on and observers <coughs> with uh, your interest and attention to this part of this year's Historical Society Conference as we talk about this relatively new, recently released book called A Wildland Ethic the story of wilderness in Montana. This book has a long history. And I think the first thing I'll do, if it sounds all right, and Kirby, interrupt me at any time. If you want to redirect me, uh, that's fine with me. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, but I'll give a little bit of a brief history of the evolution of the book. I was asked when I was a member of the Montana Wilderness Association Council back in 2013, uh, to be part of and uh, later asked to be the uh, director of a oral history project for the Montana Wilderness Association. So Wayne, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but do you want to bring up your slideshow? Uh, yeah, you want me to start that now? Sure. Yeah, you might as well. And you can just leave it on that first image and... Um... Uh, let's see here, where is my slideshow? There we go. There we go. Okay, how's that? Perfect. So um, the first slide, by the way, is of the late Jim Posowitz, who died just recently in early July, a giant in the history of conservation in Montana. But uh, back to the book. <clears throat> so I did this, <clears throat> pardon me, history project over several years, an oral history project doing interviews, the majority of them interviews with ultimately 45 uh, greats in the history of conservation of Montana <clears throat> for the Montana Wilderness Association. Early on in my development of that project, <clears throat> I came up with the idea 
uh, publishing a book is part of this history project. The original idea I got for that was something that the Wyoming Wilderness Association had done in publishing a book in celebration of the 20th anniversary of their major wilderness bill that was passed in 1984. They printed their book in 2004. So along the way, as I did these interviews, working with the MWA, working with the MWA Council, uh, later was formed as a uh, advisory uh, board to the MWA Council was what's called the Council of Elders, which I became a member of. And uh, Council of Elders kind of picked up the ball. Later, the Council of Elders became independent, and now the present body is the Montana Conservation Elders. And with wonderful help from these folks, including Dale Burke, who will be on here soon on this conference today. Dale Burke is an author, editor, and publisher. Dale Burke became the publisher of this book that we're discussing today. And so as uh, things developed, uh, Dale and I had this idea of a book maybe of pushing 190 or 200 pages, uh, perhaps with having about 20 authors. Fortunately, with all the resources available, and all the people willing to write and willing to contribute photographs, we ultimately ended up with 46 chapters, 43 authors, well over 100 photographs, some black and white of notable historical people, many uh, color photographs, quality photographs featuring beautiful Montana landscapes. And the ultimate product is out. It's a product of Dale Burke and Stony Dale Press. Dale Burke and I were the editors of the book. It's also a product of the Montana Conservation Elders. And it's something that we're going to be using in our educational efforts prospectively from this point on. Obviously, Dale and I are biased, but we think it's an important book <clears throat> uh, celebrating the glorious history of wilderness in Montana, the battles, the successes, the disappointments along the way, going back from the passage of the Wilderness Act, the federal legislation signed by Lyndon Bain Johnson in 1964. So I think I'll stop there, see what other questions that you may have from this point, uh, Kirby, and uh, see uh, what, to, what to do next. Kirby? I'm sorry, uh, Wayne, what? Yeah. Can you hear me? Question. Yeah. Do you have a question? No, no, no. Did you ask me a question? No, no. I just want to see uh, with my open introductory comments, do you want me to start? I could do this several ways from this point. Uh, one thing with the slides up is I could just go through these slides. Right. And yeah. Yeah, you just do your part, and we're still trying to get Dale on board. So, so go ahead and do what you're going to do, and when you finish up, hopefully we'll have Dale ready to go. Okay, with the slideshow, again, starting off, I have 10 slides to show, and these are photographs that I selected from our book. And the first slide is a, a very important slide. It's a picture of Jim Posowitz who, um, again, as I mentioned, is a great in conservation history. Jim is originally from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. He came out to Montana to play football for the Montana State Bobcats and actually played on one of their national championship teams uh, as a Bobcat. He stayed in Montana. His education and training was in wildlife biology. And Jim had a career with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, as we now call that state agency. Unfortunately, Jim died in early July of this year. We all miss him. Uh, he was a wonderful human being with a uh, optimistic and a rosy perspective on the United States and on the American democracy and its eventual coming to making the proper and important decisions about protecting our wildlife heritage, our public lands, and conservation in general, including our free-flowing rivers. 
Jim Posiewicz was a leader in the battle to stop the proposed Allenspur Dam near Livingston on the Yellowstone River. And to this day, the Yellowstone River is the longest river in the United States, lower 48 anyway, that is free flowing. And we can thank Jim for that. Jim is an author. And um, he is also uh, was a member of Montana Conservation Elders. And Jim originated the concept of the Montana Outdoor Hall of Fame. And uh, about four years later, was one of the inductees in the Montana Outdoor Hall of Fame. The next slide <coughs> is another photograph. Again, all these are from our book, A Wildland Ethic. And this slide shows some obvious notable politicians on the national scene. Going from left to right, President Kennedy, this was taken while he was president, Scoop or Henry Scoop Jackson, U.S. Senator from the state of Washington, our very own Lee Metcalf, U.S. Senator of Montana, Mike Mansfield, our very own U.S. Senator, and of course, Lyndon Bain Johnson at that time, Vice President, who is to become the president who signed into law the, the Wilderness Act in 1964. Mike Mansfield uh, still holds the record for the longest tenure of Senate Majority Leader. Lee Metcalf is uh, arguably perhaps the greatest senator in Montana history from the perspective of those who are conservationists. Lee Metcalf is a native Montanan from Stevensville, which is, by the way, where Dale Burke now lives. He uh, went to law school. He had several different uh, elected offices here in the state of Montana, Attorney General. He was a Montana State Supreme Court judge, later U.S. Congressman, and then U.S. Senator. Lee, unfortunately, died uh, too early in his time. He died here in Helena, and I believe it was early 1978 while he was a U.S. Senator. Lee has done so much, he has done so much for conservation and specifically wilderness bills uh, for our state. It's too much to enumerate here, but it's uh, described in several different chapters in the book. Mike Mansfield, everybody knows Mike, one of the greats. The next photo is uh, John Gatchel who is a Montana Wilderness Association staffer. By the way, today is John's birthday. Happy birthday, John. John has been with the Montana Wilderness Association in various capacities for about 35 years. I think a little bit over that now, in fact. He was conservation director for the MWA for many, many years, several decades, in fact. John's knowledge of uh, the public lands in Montana is simply encyclopedic. His knowledge of every mile, every section of trails, of the national forest, as well as other state and federal lands is incredible. And this has helped to, uh, for his own knowledge base and working as an advocate for our public lands, for wilderness, and that's wilderness with a capital W, as in federally designated wilderness, and so much in the way of conservation. John's still working as a senior conservation director for the NWA. The next photo is Cecil Garland. Cecil Garland was uh, a hillbilly, frankly. I don't think he'd mind that. Cecil Garland died a few years ago uh, from the mountains, as they call them, the Appalachians anyway, in the western part of North Carolina. Came out to Montana. He was a veteran of World War II. I interviewed Cecil Garland. He was one of my 45 narrators for the History Project. I traveled down to west central Utah in a very remote place to interview Cecil in what turned out to be just about four days before he unfortunately died back in the year, I believe, 2014. Cecil lived in Lincoln. He was a small businessman there. He had a hardware and outdoor store in Lincoln. 
Cecil was one of the leaders in a first in the history of conservation in wilderness in Montana. Cecil fought and led to the designation of the scapegoat wilderness in 1972, a long and fascinating story, which I can't get into details, of course, here today. There is so much to it, and it's described in detail in the book in several different chapters. Cecil was courageous. He was stubborn. He spoke how he felt, not only here in Montana, but also in Washington, D.C., going to congressional hearings there and uh, speaking of his passion and his love for, as it used to be called and still is, the Lincoln backcountry. He built coalitions to get that wilderness bill passed, the first citizen-initiated legislation ever. Before that, all the wilderness bills since the passage of the Wilderness Act in 1964 had been done by the initiation of the agencies, usually the uh, National Forest, the Forest Service. The next photo is taken by Bert Lindler. Bert Lindler, who for many years was a journalist, outdoor column for the Great Falls Tribune. Bert Lindler now lives in Missoula. His uh, actual last name is, by the way, spelled L-I-N-D-L-E-R. Bert took this photo on obviously a winter trip and the drainages of the Middle Fork of the Flathead River. This area is now part of the Great Bear Wilderness, which is de designated as wilderness legislatively in 1978. One of the major uh, advocates for this was Dale Burke. Uh, and a few others, the Craighead brothers, John and Frank Craighead, were also instrumental in getting this wilderness bill passed. For those that don't know the specifics, the Great Bear Wilderness is a wilderness area uh, primarily along the, uh, again, Middle Fork of the Flathead drainage. It is sandwiched between, if you will, uh, Glacier National Park and the Bob Marshall Wilderness area. The next slide here, <coughs> excuse me, is a photo taken of a rally in the Capitol building right under the dome. In early 2019, during the legislative session that year of the Montana legislature. This was a rally in support of our public land. The speakers were many. Photographed uh, during this uh, also uh, was featured in this and other photographs was our governor, Steve Bullock, Senator John Tester was there, many other local conservationists were there, Mary Hollow of Prickly Pear Land Trust is one, and many others speaking from the perspectives of Native Americans, of conservationists, of hunters, of fishermen, and people who just like to get in the great outdoors. It was a very successful rally. We had another rally about a year. Uh, apart from this one, there was an outdoor rally on a very cold, bitter winter day. It was also amazingly well attended for people all over the state coming to Helena, coming to the cattle, to the Capitol to express their support for conservation. This is a, a really striking photo. This was taken by Gene Sense's daughter. If you look closely, the upper right, up against that cloud, you see a silhouette, and that's Gene Sense. Gene Sense has uh, been a teacher for years. That was his career, teacher in Shoto. And Gene Sense and his wife, Linda, are probably two of the nicest, sweetest people I've ever met. We need more people like Gene and Linda Sense. Uh, Sarah, since the daughter, is also active in environmental issues uh, here in the state of Montana. <laughs> Gene is also an expert photographer, uh, as witnessed by this photo. This was taken along the Rocky Mountain front at Swift Lake, for those people who know what that is, east of the divide, up fairly north up toward Glacier Country. And it's a stunning photo that has been featured in the, one of the MWA annual calendars. And uh, I find this photo just uh, stunning. 
Next slide is a photo of Doug Farrell, who is uh, one of the initiators, if not the real initiator of the idea of the MWA having a history project. Doug is, uh, lives in the Trout Creek area. He's a small businessman. He's a builder, contractor, and designer. Uh, he's originally from the Midwest, graduate of Brown University, came out here in kind of hippie style to live in the uh, Northern Rockies many years ago, decades ago. This is photographed in the Cabinet Mountains, an area that he loves. <clears throat> That's his part of the state, and he loves it. One of the things that Doug has done, uh, besides being uh, president of the MWA Council at one time, and a continued strong advocate for the MWA, Doug is a leader in what's an organization called the Friends of the Scotsman Peaks. That is a conservation group and an advocacy group pushing for designation as wilderness of the Scotsman Peaks area, which is an area that straddles both Montana and Idaho, due west of the Cabinet Mountain Wilderness. It's an area that is uh, wild, it's beautiful, it's an area that is very different from, say, this part of the state, in that it's kind of a temperate rainforest, if you will, very moist, uh, and it's wild country with wonderful wildlife. Doug is a strong believer in collaborative efforts. Doug does the hard work. He and his compatriots are meeting with people across the table, people that they don't necessarily agree with on too much, but they meet face to face and they hash out and they work compromises with the ultimate goal of getting things done. He's a great guy, very positive. This next photo is a photo of the Terry Badlands. And it's courtesy of Karen Stevenson, who's a wonderful lady. Karen and her husband, her husband is an architect. They live on a ranch near Miles City. Karen, every year, for many years, has led an MWA wilderness walk and their wilderness walks program for the Terry Badlands. And I've done this myself. I've had the privilege of being part of one of the groups just a few years ago. The Terry Badlands uh, is representative of the wild country in eastern Montana. We, Dale Burke and I, made a point from very early on emphasizing that this book needs to be geographically representation representative of all the different parts of Montana, Northwest, Southwest, Central, Eastern. And Karen Stevenson wrote a chapter for the book. Our photograph here represents that part of the state. For those that don't know, the Terry Badlands is a wilderness study area of about 44,000 acres. It's along the Yellowstone River, as you can guess, just outside the town of Terry, Montana. And it's wild and woolly, it's classic Badlands scenery, it's wonderful hiking. And uh, as an aside, I'd like to mention that Karen Stevenson is uh, a fabulous person with multiple interests. She's very involved with the local community. She was a teacher for many years. And for those that have watched the Montana PBS production of the history of Evelyn Cameron, the photographer originally from England who lived in Terry, Montana. In that PBS production, Kieran Stevenson is the one who plays the role of Evelyn Cameron. The last photo here is of Guy Brandborg. Guy Brandborg is one of those bigger than life people. He uh, is a career forester. He passed away in 1978. His son, Stuart Brandborg, who died just about three years ago, father and son, tandem of career foresters, professionals with the U.S. Forest Service. I could spend a day talking with Stuart about Stuart, but I'll have to focus on Guy here right now. Guy Brandborg is a forester in the Bitterroots, in the Bitterroot National Forest, and in the valleys of the Bitterroot Valley and the small communities around there, was a man who believed in the utilitarian uses of the National Forest. At the same time, 
he was courageous and that he almost single-handedly fought the Forest Service and redirected their policies and their plans away from tree harvesting, which was prominent in the post-World War II era of the economic boom and the housing boom of the 40s and 50s. Guy Brandborg worked to make the Forest Service management of the forest more broad-based with conservation in mind, wildlife management, stream management, fisheries management, is a big part of how they do their forest plans and their travel plans. So Guy Brandborg on a national level was key in redirecting how the Forest Service managed those public lands, about 200 million acres of public lands that we have as part of our public legacy here for the people of the United States and for the people of Montana. A great man. So that's my slideshow. So now I'll ask Kirby as far as uh, any thoughts that he has or questions that he want to he wants to ask me. Well let's let's um, we have uh, Dell, we think you're there. Can you look on your screen and see if there's a way to unmute yourself? If you can figure out how to unmute your phone, then we should be good to go. And we can have Dell's part, and then we will come back and. Um... And Dale, you might have to touch your screen, and maybe something will pop up from the bottom saying unmute. We're not hearing you yet, Dale. Okay, well, um, Wayne, I tell you what, if, in case we don't get Dale, if he, if Dale, if he's fine, you can just jump right in. Uh, if we aren't able to connect, uh, if it's okay with you, Wayne, what I will do is just, I'm just going to read a little something from the book that I thought was really great. For people who, who haven't seen this book, I think you'll definitely want to get a copy. Uh, it's one of those books you can sit down and read the whole thing, or you can just pick it up and and read a, an essay or two and look at the photos and um, you know come back to it later. You don't have to read the whole thing in one sitting, but you can if you want to. Anyway, uh, I think many people, especially in Helena, knew the Reverend George Harper, who was at uh, St. St. Paul's uh, Methodist Church here in Helena for many, many years. And his son, Hal, wrote uh, a short chapter, chapter seven. But in it, he talks about a letter. George came out to check out Montana and see if it's some place that um, his family might want to live. And so this is this letter is included in the book, and I'm just going to read it. Um, and so George writes, and um, Dorothy, um, George's wife and Hal's mother, is is uh, reading this to the kids. And so she, Dorothy, read, Rusty Hal, Stevie, and Nancy. Daddy is on the train coming home from a land that will be our new home before long. It is the land where the mountains are so tall that the snow on top of their heads becomes the white clouds that float around them and the earth and sky are one big picture that you stand and look at, never quite believing it could be real, but it is real. You can touch the clean earth. You can ride on horseback up and up and up the green grassy shoulders of the mountains and watch the deer and elk run and see the black bear go lumbering off into the shade of the tall trees. And you can catch the glint of sunlight reflecting a rainbow from the leaping trout, which break the stillness of lakes so clear you can hardly see the water. And you can breathe the clean air and sing because you almost burst with joy. It is the land of the big sky. You feel little standing under its hot, bright sunlight of a crisp, cloudless morning 
or lying on your back looking up at the night with stars so big and near, you feel you can reach up and touch them. You learn what humility means, but at the same time, you feel big. There is no place for little thoughts or narrow feelings. It's just too big of a country for little things. The Indians love their, quote, land of shining mountains. The people who live in its fine out of doors now love it too. You can feel and see the pride and the wonder in their eyes when they look across the rolling plain to the white peaks, and it will be ours to be proud of too. We are moving to Montana and the big land will welcome us. You will ride her mountain trails and learn the secrets of her forests. You will work on the prairie and learn the ways of horses and cattle. You will grow straight and tall like the pine tree and graceful and swift and strong as the deer. And you will be clean and honest as the wide open country, which has nothing to be ashamed of. It is a land where the people are still pioneers and where the church is a straightforward church. Its young men and young women need to be banded together in a movement to make the people and policy of the state as much a part of God's perfect plan as the mountains are. That is why we are going there to live. God wants us to help out there. More and more people will come and the state will grow better or worse. We will grow up with the state and we will help shape its future. It is our land, yes, and ours to love and to build. It's our land of shining mountains, Montana. Mont Mother and daddy are taking you there to live with a prayer that the big land and the big sky will help us to grow big too. Love, daddy. And I think that letter to me just says everything um, about wilderness that needs to be saying. So I think it's a beautiful letter. And Dale, are you there yet? Okay, well, Wayne, um, do you have anything else you want to say? And, um, and or does anybody have any questions they want to ask? I think one thing that's been covered already, but uh, to kind of reemphasize uh, one point uh, is a corollary from that is this book is an anthology, uh, an anthology of well over 40 authors. And the reason that I wanted to to do this is because the variety of perspectives that are represented here, obviously there's a common thread of people who love Montana's outdoors, public lands and wilderness areas. But the variety of perspectives I feel was important to broaden the appeal of this book to readers. We want this book to go beyond just preaching to the choir. We really want this to, book to be a national book and we wanted to uh, bring in more people who are going to be supporters and advocates for the public lands here in Montana. And just as a, a little bit of a perspective on this, as far as the authors and some categories I'd like to mention, the authors of this book are journalists, they're writers, they're small business people. We made a particular emphasis in getting Native American voices conservationists, of course, agency personnel, certainly, MWA staff people, farmers, ranchers, outfitters, religious leaders, as Kirby so well brought out just uh, there a little while ago in his reading, professional people, teachers, and others that really uh, give these different perspectives on how important it is that we love our public lands and we work to defend them. So do we have any questions out there for Wayne? I'm not seeing any, but as we know, maybe. Oh, okay. There we have one. I'm just like. So, Wayne, could you tell us yeah. a little more about the Montana Wilderness Association? Maybe you could elaborate on one of the skipped stories about a person that you uh, uh, kind of glanced over earlier. Good question. So, the Montana Wilderness Association is a. Uh, major conservation nonprofit organization here in Montana. 
It's been around for over 60 years. MWA was formed back in 1958 <coughs> in the Baxter Hotel in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, some people and two of those founders of that organization, the book is dedicated to those people, Ken and Florence Baldwin. They are among the founders of the Montana Wilderness Association. It's now an organization of about 5,000 members. And this group works, as you can pretty much guess from the title, focuses their attention on uh, advocating for a wilderness designation in our state. In the state of Montana, we have a little bit less than 3% of our land area that is designated wilderness. All starting with a passage of the Wilderness Act in 1964, when at that time we gained wilderness designation for five areas of Montana, examples being the Bob Marshall Wilderness, the Cabinet Mountain Wilderness, the Gates of the Mountains Wilderness area, right here near Helena, the Anaconda Pentler Wilderness, and some others that were uh, designated then and then later. The Montana Wilderness Association works for the remainder of those lands that are worthy of wilderness, that have been recommended as wilderness by agency bodies, primarily the Forest Service, but also the BLM and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and works for these areas to hopefully someday become designated wilderness areas. That designation is a federal legislative process involving our state's congressional delegation, as well as the U.S. Congress and the legislation that must be signed by the U.S. President. The MWA has wonderful programs. I encourage people, if they're not already members, to check their website, which is www.wildmontana.org to read about uh, the programs that they have, the activities they do, the dedicated staff people that work for the MWA. And I also want to mention as a side there for grassroots organization, they do one thing in particular that I'm very fond of and I'm biased because I'm a participant. It's a trip leader for what they call the Wilderness Waltz Program of the MWA that every year does summer and winter hikes or snowshoe trips into Montana backcountry areas. Almost all of them are day trips to get people to just simply, if they're not already, to get them to fall in love with the outdoors of Montana. So that's what the MWA is all about in a nutshell. Please check their website for further details. And as far as stories go, I believe there was a kind of a corollary question about any stories uh, that people have uh, in the book uh, that uh, readers may be interested in. And there's so many in here, it's kind of overwhelming to try to select one. Um, and I think one theme that I would emphasize and these writers is their love of our public lands and their desire to be willing to defend these public lands. But I think I will just go through the table of contents here and mention a couple of stories that are very uh, enthralling. One of them is written by a fellow named Greg Schatz, who's a builder and packer up in the Forest Service in the Whitefish area, it's chapter 22. And it's a word or two about Scruffy in the Wilderness. It's the title of this chapter. And it's about one of his beloved horses named Scruffy. And so I would encourage people, of course, to buy the book uh, and to read that chapter because it's, uh, it's very heartwarming. Another chapter in here that I would uh, cite, uh, and I would cite this also particularly because uh, it looks like Dale is having some trouble getting on here is a chapter that he wrote going back to his childhood. Dale Burke uh, grew up in the Tobacco Valley area of Montana, Northwest Montana. His father was a Jippo logger, small operation logger up there. 
And Dale gives a story about when he was a young man of his grandmother, who was a cook for outfitters and guides up in that part of the country, including Glacier. And Dale tells a story of somebody that his grandmother met. And um, it's a very enthralling story that um, I'm a little bit reluctant to get on the details because I'm hoping that Dale may still be able to um, get on here. But it's a story about uh, Dale's grandmother is a cook. One of the clients on one of the trips was a noted American journalist, Ernie Powell, who I'm sure everybody's heard of, the journalist during the World War II era. Ernie sadly was killed in the later stages of World War II. And Ernie Powell was a client on one of these trips in Glacier National Park. And for the left, for the rest of Ernie's life, his favorite place in all the world was Glacier National Park. And Ernie wrote about that. And it's a very touching story uh, to read about. Uh, along those lines, I think I would say one thing as far as something in my con contribution to the book. Uh, I wrote the afterwards for the, bird, uh, for the book, and I would uh, insert here a slight one thing briefly. And I started off um, uh, afterwards citing John Steinbeck and his book Travels with Charlie, which he published in 1961. And I'd read that book, and I remember this quote, and uh, when I was tasked to write the afterword, this came to mind, and I put this in my afterword. It's a quote from the great writer John Steinbeck. I am in love with Montana. For other states, I have admiration, respect, recognition, even some affection. But with Montana, it is love. It's difficult to analyze love when you're in it. And this is an author who traveled all over the country with his poodle named Charlie and a small camper uh, as he traveled all around the United States and the one state that John Steinbeck fell in love with is the state of Montana. So Wayne, we have some other questions coming in. Um, okay. Before we do that, can you, do you want to turn your video back on, um, on your computer? That way people can see you talk and not just have to stare at me. Okay, so I think that's share screen, is that correct? Well, I, um, you can- Or is it start video? No, I think it's, yeah, start video. It says unable to start video because the host has stopped it. Hmm. Well, he didn't stop it on purpose. <laughs> I, oh, I'm sure. Uh, huh. Should I try share screen? Uh, sure, if you want to. And in the meantime, I'll go ahead and ask some of these questions. Um, so let's see, what, what la currently, what lands are you working on to save? Uh, okay, I don't have, so I'll try to start video again. It says unable to start video, I apologize. If you have any thoughts, uh, just let me know while I answer these questions. Yeah, and that, I don't know if you want us to read your email or not, that's there right now. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure. Hey, what I, how about if I put the slide, the slideshow back on? That okay. Um, I do see the Q&A is what I've got on now. Anyway, I should get to these questions because sure. time is limited. Uh, so the question was, what other areas uh, is the MWA working on for preservation and preservation from the MWA perspective? I think I've got it now. At least I'll see you on the screen is wilderness designation. And these areas are under different categories, wilderness study areas, and there are many wilderness study areas in the state of Montana. It goes back to the heritage of Lee Metcalf when he was US Senator, passing the Montana Wilderness Study Act in 1977. That was federal legislation signed by the president which established 10 wilderness study areas in the state of Montana. 
And those areas are all over the state. I mentioned the Terry Badlands earlier is one of these wilderness study areas. And these areas are in limbo, frankly, politically. They are areas certainly worthy of wilderness designation as approved by the Forest Service or other federal agencies like the BLM, but they have not passed the muster, if you will, of gotten uh, designation formally by the Congress and the President. But there are many other areas in the state that are under categories such as inventory and roadless areas that do fit in to being worthy of wilderness. And these, there are about 50 of these various areas around the state that um, the MWA works for to try to get wilderness designation down the road for these places. There are too many to uh, discuss here, I think, in the short time we have left, but I would encourage readers to look at the back of the book. We have a listing of some of these areas. We also have in the back of the book to help out uh, a listing of about 20 prominent conservation groups in Montana uh, for readers to consider to uh, investigate and possibly join. The, the uh, website again of the Montana Wilderness Association, www.wildmontana.org, has a listing of all these potential wilderness areas. Okay, great. Another comment, beautiful pictures. How long did it take you to compile the, uh, around, uh, compile the pictures and content of so many contributors to this book? Great question. Many photographers, we have, uh, we have over 40 authors and we also have over 30 photographers who contributed to this book. Dale Burke contributed uh, particularly some of these historical photos that we have in the book that are black and white. A few of those I selected in the live show. Most of the pictures, the photographs are color landscapes of uh, beautiful Montana scenery. And I would cite in particular one photographer who is also an author of uh, I'm Biased Here, but one of the better chapters in the book, and that's a fellow Pete Bengefield, who lives in Dillon. And Pete is also an accomplished photographer who has traveled the country, particularly the Western United States, and taken marvelous uh, professional photographs uh, around the United States and of course in particular Montana. Pete is a retired agency person uh, living and working in Montana for decades, a wonderful fellow and I would encourage people to buy the book uh, for another reason and that's to read Pete's chapter in the book which does a good history of the origins in the evolutions of our public lands in Montana, uh, politically, and uh, how they impact all of us economically and socially. Okay, so you mentioned the Terry Badlands. I have not been there. Is there any of the area accessible by road? Yes. There is a road that goes in uh, into the Terry Badlands. The Terry Badlands is just off the Yellowstone River it's actually just a couple of miles away from the town of Terry. And uh, there is a road that leads into part of it, of course, uh, if and when it receives wilderness designation, that road will not be part of the wilderness area. Again, it's about 44,000 acres in uh, aggregate. But that road does give you access into facilitate hiking there. And uh, it's classic Badlands scenery, it's dry country, but it's also reminiscent also with a touch of Southern Utah with red rock scenery, bands of sedimentary rocks, wildlife, of course, and it's a very romantic place. Well, you also mentioned conducting oral um, interviews. Are those available somewhere, maybe online? Those interviews that I did, uh, and almost all of them are video interviews, are part of the MWA History Project. And the interviews uh, that I've done are available. I'll be glad to help out anybody 
Uh, I can give anybody a listing of the interviews that I've done, and I'll be glad to send the USB memory device or whatever copies of those interviews. We have them pre preserved on several external hard drives. Uh, one in the MWA office here in Helena at the uh, Bluestone Building and others in various places, including, of course, I have one here at home. And I'll be glad, glad to work with any individual or any entity that is interesting, interested in watching some of those videos. It's about a terabyte of information. There's a lot in there. Uh, hours and hours of interviews. And it's, um, of course, I'm biased, but I think they're very educational. Great. And, and speaking of education, does the MWA have presenters who visit schools across the state to share their message of the importance of wilderness? Yes, the MWA has a staff of about 20 people. And in their advocacy, they do presentations to uh, any and all public groups that are interested in learning about what the MWA does and groups or individuals that are interested in our public lands and their present status and what the MWA does in the way of ad advocacy to help protect those lands. As an aside there, I'll also mention Montana Conservation Elders. We're working for education and that we wanna teach through teachers in the state, train teachers to teach the history of conservation here in Montana, citing people such as the late Jim Posseways and the courage of these people and what they've accomplished. So is, is there a relationship between the MWA and the Montana Outdoor Hall of Fame or is that a separate group? They are separate. The Montana Outdoor Hall of Fame was originated by Jim Posseways actually because Jim had attended a meeting of the Wyoming Outdoor Hall of Fame some years ago, and Jim figured, well, if Wyoming can have an Outdoor Hall of Fame, Montana can have an Outdoor Hall of Fame. So he started the concept with his great connections and leadership, got it going. Uh, he was not in the first class of inductees. That was about six years ago uh, for reasons that he was the initiator, so they waited to induct him in the second class of inductees. But the Montana Outdoor Hall of Fame is more associated with agencies such as Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and the Montana Outdoor Legacy Foundation. You can check those agencies through uh, Google them through the websites and you can get connected or connect directly to the Montana Outdoor Hall of Fame. We've had three classes of inductees each class can just consisting of approximately 10 people and uh, they're wonderful people and they have wonderful stories. Great. Well, I'm just not saying unless someone else has a last minute question here for us. I think we've answered them. Um, I, Wayne, uh, anything else? Final parting messages? Um, I would, uh, since we're ending the program, I mean, there's so many things I could say as far as in defense of our public lands and the history of how it all came about, which I wanted to kind of emphasize today. But I think I'll end it as I ended the book with my afterward, if I may, uh, and talk about, uh, as I describe my own personal journey, which I'm not going to get into, of course. I wanted to end the book with a message of hope, with a call for activism with a motivation for people to um, realize the responsibility that we have for future generations. I ask for people to give their attention and their thoughts, maybe away in this highly partisan political era that we live in, it's sad, but it's a fact, to get away from some more negative feelings and to redirect people to more positive things such as going outdoors and to recreate in the natural world with their families, getting young people out. And one thing I find interesting is the word recreate. It can either be read as recreate or recreate. Recreate is an interesting word because we talk about recreation 
in the Montana Wilderness Association. It can be looked upon as a transity for her, as to create again, to renew, restore, recharge, or stimulate. And certainly people do that when they get in the outdoors, particularly with family or friends, or solo in solitude. But recreate can also be an intransitive verb, as in to take recreation is having fun outdoors. So the two connect, and we really want to focus on getting the younger generation outdoors because we feel like these young people will fall in love with the outdoors and they're the next generation of conservationists and advocates for protection of our public lands. And the book ends with a call to action and I ask each reader to do something to protect our wild places. Write letters, join groups, support with uh, financial donations, things like that. And I end by thanking the reader as I end here today, but I want to thank all the participants and I want to thank the Historical Society for hosting us. Dale and I appreciate this immensely. Well, Wayne, thank you so much. This was, um, we do apologize for our technical difficulties, but in spite of that, I think this has been a great program. Uh, Wayne, we certainly appreciate your, um, your just jumping right in there and uh, Dale, we're sorry that we, we're having this difficulty. We'll try to figure out a way to, to um, make that up later. We thank everyone for their patience and bearing with us. Um, I think as a, with Wayne's um, closing there, I think there's only one thing to say, but before I say that, I have to do a commercial and say, if you don't have this book already, you certainly wanna buy a copy, uh, both for the text and for the photographs of uh, people have mentioned. And if you haven't bought a copy, you probably want to come into the Montana Historical Society uh, bookstore and uh, get your copy here. While you're here, you'll also want to take a look at our brand new exhibit that just opened on called Who Speaks to You? And that is an exhibit of portraits from the permanent collection here. Um, again, thanks, Wayne. And like I say, the only the final thing I think we should say is we should all Get off our computers and get outside and enjoy this beautiful day. We're lucky to live in such a place and um, we should go outside, take a hike and think about that. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kirby.